the island of Tenerife in the Canaries. Its beaches are a favorite haunt of sun-starved holidaymakers from all over northern Europe. Way above these beaches, literally up in the clouds, is Tenerife's Los Rodeos Airport, now little used since it became the most notorious airport in the world. A thousand people lost their lives here in accidents, much of it due to the fact that Los Rodeos is shrouded in clouds on most days. Sunday, March the 27th, 1977, was just such a day. Flying to the Canaries were two jumbo jets, Boeing 747s. Both were charter flights, one a Pan American plane full of tourists, the other a Dutch jet belonging to KLM Airlines. One of the many strange things about that day was that neither pilot had set out for Tenerife. We were starting our descent for the approach and landing at uh, Las Palmas, our original destination. And as we were doing that, we got a call from air traffic control to divert immediately to Tenerife. A terrorist bomb on the next island had caused this small airport to suddenly become choked with planes. Bob Bragg was the co-pilot on the Pan Am Jumbo. It's the first time he's been back to Los Rodeos since that Sunday in 1977. Twenty years later, bits of his plane are still all around. When we landed here, the entire ramp was completely and totally congested. There were probably 20 to 30 airplanes that had also diverted and were parked here, which necessitated us having to go way down to the end here and park. By now, there are 400 people who've been up all night, uh, half the day before, possibly, and they don't quite understand what's going on. And our information was certainly limited at that point. We really didn't know the circumstances or what, was, what had actually transpired. The um, facilities on board, I suppose, by now were a little, um, well, it was busy, let me put it that way, and everybody was restless. The Dutch pilot, Captain Van Zanten, was getting restless too. His plane had been parked alongside the Pan Am, and the American pilots could hear him constantly on the radio, anxious to be on his way before he ran out of flying hours. He was very irritated about the situation, as I'm sure all of us were, because most of us had uh, been flying all night long, and uh, we were all anxious to get to our destination. Uh, basically, about that time, he decided to start refueling. Concurrent with that, they opened up the airport at Las Palmas. So the engineer and I got out and walked and measured the wingtip clearance between the KLM 747 and our 747. And we found out that we were about 12 feet short of being able to get around him and taxi out. So we had to wait for the KLM airplane to refuel. The two aircraft had been parked at the wrong end of the runway for takeoff. And with so many planes choking the airport, the only way they could get to the correct end was by taxiing up the runway itself. This simulation recreates the acknowledged facts of the accident. Air traffic control ordered the KLM to go first and wait when it got to the far end. The Pan Am would follow behind, but would turn off the runway about three quarters of the way along to allow the KLM to take off. By the time we got the clearance that we were going to leave and take off, uh, people were very happy by then. They were quite elated. These were uh, people who were going to meet a cruise ship in the Canary Islands and cruise around the Mediterranean and uh, a lot of them were senior citizens uh, that had come from uh, California. As the Pan Am entered the runway in its turn, clouds began to roll down from the surrounding hills. The American pilots soon found themselves crawling through the dense mist looking for their turn off. By now the KLM plane had already reached the far end, turned and was anxious to be on its way. The tower called us and asked were we off the runway, and I said, negative, we're still on the runway, but we will report clear of the runway. We looked up and we saw the KLM airplane's lights, uh, and I immediately saw the lights shaking, and I said, I think he's moving, and uh, then I, it was very obvious that he was moving. 
So I started yelling, get off, get off. And the captain turned the airplane, went to full power on the throttles. As we were turning, I looked back out of the right window and uh, couldn't believe it that he was doing what he was doing. And I'll never forget, I saw the rotating beacon uh, underneath the belly of the airplane. I closed my eyes and ducked. And I didn't even think he'd done us any damage. It was very little noise, uh, very little shaking or anything. I was just very, very aware of things in, in slow motion and, and everything was flying around and all of a sudden everything settled and nothing looked like it had before. I didn't see anything I recognized. I, there were no people around. It looked like someone had taken a big knife and just sliced the entire top of the airplane off. I could see all the way to the tail of the airplane. So I reached down to try to shut off the engines with the start levers, which controls the fuel to the engines. Uh, that didn't do any good. Obviously, all the controls were severed. Then I reached up to get the fire control handles, which is up top, which shuts the engines down. And that's when I discovered that the top of the cockpit was gone. I looked around. There was no side of the cockpit left. So I stood up and elected to jump over the side, which was about 48 feet. Dorothy Kelly found herself in the cargo hold, but managed to clamber to the top of the blazing plane. Uh, I looked over the side, and it was like looking out of the second floor window from my house uh, with nothing but jagged metal, and my thought was, by now I had lost my shoes. I've survived this, and I'm going to kill myself jumping out of here on all that debris down there. Dorothy Kelly jumped from the blazing plane, breaking an arm and fracturing her skull. She became the heroine of the crash, rescuing the captain, tending the passengers. People were lying all over the field, hurt, uh, certainly bloody, uh, very, very badly injured. Uh, one thing I remember in particular, there was a man who had his clothes almost completely blown off him. He was just uh, wandering around in a daze, and I remember I kept trying to push him off to the side and get him away, and he would just keep coming right back into all the action. People were just banging in at the windows and shouting. I mean, you could hear shouts, screams from inside. And that was probably my most vivid memory. And, and the, what has hurt the most through all those years is remembering all those people and hearing them scream and realizing that they were, they were being burned and they were not going to get out because there was no way we could get to them. Tenerife remains the world's worst ever air disaster. 583 people died. Everyone aboard the KLM plane, which was completely burnt out on the runway, all but 77 of the Pan Am passengers. Today, this is all that is left of Pan American Airlines. The company itself crashed in 1992. Paul Roish, one of its senior captains, managed to save the corporate records from a skip. Amongst them were the charred instruments from the Tenerife accident. Roish was one of the official American investigators who arrived in Tenerife next day. As the investigators gathered, their first task was to listen to radio messages between the air traffic control tower and the two planes. Roish heard something that grabbed his attention right away. There was a, a point at which you, you could not tell what the uh, KLM first officer was saying. And we asked that that be played over several times. Uh, it was obvious that the, the man was under stress. Uh, his voice changed its, its uh, timber. It became tremulous. It was slightly shaky. And, and his words were blurted out rather than spoken clearly. And that's what, that was a benchmark. That caught our attention right away. I believe that the first officer's voice changed because he saw something happening in the cockpit that shouldn't be happening. But it was the cockpit voice recorders from the two burnt out planes that were to provide the answer to the mystery. As the KLM plane reached the end of the runway and turned, Captain Van Zanten immediately began to push up the throttles to take off. First officer said, no, wait a minute, we don't have our air traffic control clearance. The captain said, 
Yes, I know that. He pulled the throttles back. Now go ahead and call for it. The controller gave them their air traffic control clearance, which tells them what route they must follow. Then they were supposed to ask for permission for the takeoff itself, but they never got that far. As the first officer was reading the clearance back to the controllers, the captain again commenced the takeoff. He pushed the throttles up, he said, we go. The aircraft started to roll. The first officer sensed that this was not right. He, he knew that they hadn't been cleared for takeoff, and so he blurted out, and we are taken off, or we are at takeoff. It wasn't even that clear. The, the words are difficult to comprehend, and the tenor of the voice changes. Uh, it's obviously very tense. But he felt that he had done his part in, in letting people know that they were commencing their takeoff. All this time, the Dutch airplane was accelerating down the runway. The flight engineer in the Dutch cockpit heard the words from the Pan Am airplane saying, uh, Roger will advise when we clear, and he questioned the, uh, the captain and the first officer. He, he said, then, is he not clear then? And the Pan American and both crew members said, yeah, yeah, he's clear. At that point, they were just entering the heavy cloud. They saw the Pan Am aircraft desperately trying to get off the runway, but it was not in time. The, uh, the rest is history. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Under international regulations, the investigation was conducted by the Spanish, but with both the Americans and Dutch allowed to participate. That's the cell car. Where is that located? Cell car computer, and I'm trying to think where that is now. Um, that is in, in that area as well. Soon there was a split amongst the investigators. And uh, the fuel flow check. The Dutch were, in my opinion, searching for, for something to fasten onto that would divert the, the blame from, from their own uh, countrymen. Mainly, I believe, they tried to pin the, the blame on the air traffic controllers. Uh, to some extent, they tried to pin the blame on, on uh, the Pan Am crew. The stakes were high. Not only the reputation of KLM, but of their most famous captain, Jacob van Zanten, the man whose face stared out of the KLM adverts. Captain van Zanten was a pilot of great prestige in KLM. Uh, he was uh, a top instructor pilot. Uh, in fact, he was so well regarded in KLM that <clears throat> it's my understanding uh, when the Dutch officials, or the KLM officials, first heard about this accident, they tried to find Van Zanten to ask him to come down and, and uh, be part of the investigation team. Unfortunately, of course, he wasn't available. The Spanish report found that the accident had been caused by the Dutch captain taking off without clearance, a basic error caused by his anxiety to get on his way. But a Dutch board of inquiry absolved Captain Van Zanten of any blame saying there had been a simple misunderstanding with air traffic control. The pilot thought he had his clearance. Paul Roish believes that Van Zanten's personality was at the heart of the accident. He was a difficult man to, to, uh, to contradict, especially for a, a junior uh, pilot such as the first officer on this flight. He did have the, uh, the courage to to uh, stop him once when, when the captain first started the throttles up, but I don't think he felt he could get away with it again.